I mean, there's a possibility somebody else could see your grade. If anyone's uncomfortable with that, then I'll. Oh, dude, I'm sure pass around a few quizzes. No, 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 no. What would you pass I'm going to pass around this stack of graded quizzes. So the grades are at the top. Someone may see your grade. Do you, anyone not want that? That's okay if you don't. No? Everyone's okay? Juan, are you okay if I pass the quizzes around? The, the graded quizzes? Are you okay with me passing those around? Okay, here they come. So this is just the first quiz. So if it didn't go well, you know, there's going to be plenty more. And I'll probably drop one or so. All right, so let's begin. Um, just recap where we are in the class. We, we are on pace right now. I'm going to try and get a little bit ahead today. Try and go through 4-7 as quickly as, as quickly as possible and get us into 5-5. Five, five. Um, we'll see how that goes. And then our first exam is actually, what, next Thursday? Is that right? Next Thursday. Right, next Thursday is our first exam. So we're going to do 4.7. We're going to start substitution. And then next week we'll be doing more substitution integration by parts. Um, the stuff we do on Tuesday of next week, the stuff we do Tuesday of next week, some of it may appear on exam one, but not like the full-blown, it'll just be the, 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 the basic stuff. Are you going to review for it? I'll give you some guidance. I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like yet in terms of what that is, but um, it'll be something. Just like workable problem type of practice for the exam? May, this is a, I mean, this exam, there's not a ton of material on it, right? I mean, there's inverse trig, hyperbolic, antiderivative. So it's not a whole, whole lot. You, when we get to the next exam, it's a ton of stuff. You need a lot more guidance, right? Like, look, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. So you need to know what I'm going to emphasize. So I would say just review homework, review problems we did in class. But yes? How many questions I don't know. I have to go look at my exam ones, what they've looked like in the past. Um, I'll let you all know about how many questions. I, I try and make the test where it can be completed by the average student in the hour 40 minutes, right? So it's re really not so much in the number of questions as it is just what I'm asking, right? All right, so that's where we are. Um, any questions over anything from 3.5 or 3.6? Yes? So uh, uh, on the test for, I guess, exam one, would you expect to see something kind of like the last question on 3.6? No. The one with the differential equation one, or the, yeah, that? The one with the, the wire in the pole? Probably not, no. I wouldn't expect something like that. It's going to be much more just the mechanics of things, knowing how to do chain rule and stuff with these new, new functions we have. Maybe an identity, where you have to like show something is equal to that, like hyperbolic stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. The point where the curve meets the line. Yes. I, that one was initially confusing because I was thinking of it as like a this angle between the actual curve and the line. Okay. And after looking into it, I realized it was just asking the angle between the tangent. Yes. Is there such a thing as the angle between the curve? Or is that ever a thing that we hear about? Well, it, it, it can only really, it only really makes sense if you talk about the tangent because you know, if you have a, a pole here, right, and you have a wire, let's say it's connected to that point, and you have a wire that comes in like that. I'm exaggerating it so we can see it. And we're trying to talk about the angle here that the wire comes into the pole. The, the wire is not straight, right? right? It's not straight. So, like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to find any angle that would make sense, right, to talk about an angle between here and here, because this is not a straight line, the only thing that would possibly make sense is to talk about the tangent line at this point, and now you have a straight line, and then it makes sense to talk about an angle. And then you but could have a collection of tangent lines. You could have a collection of tangent lines, but the further away you get, the less accurate it's going to be, right? Because if I'm down here, that angle is way different than if I'm right there. So the tangent line is like the best answer 
to the question of what's the angle between the wire and the pole. And really the only one that we care about. The only one that really matters, yeah. Good question. Anything else? I wanted to see a show of hands. Oh, my sign-in sheet. I have not passed this around. <laughs> I forgot last week. So you'll see your name. You'll see today's date. Real small box. Initial in there. Just put your little initial. And uh, I'll try and remember to pass that around every day. Um, okay, so I just wanted to take a quick little vote. We're going to talk about antiderivatives today. And I know in my Cal 1 we cover that. All right. So I just want a show of hands. How many of you... Remember in Cal 1 talking about antiderivatives. Anybody know? Anyone know? So nobody in here has never heard of antiderivatives. Okay? All right, good. That's going to dictate how fast I go through this. All right, so starting with 4.7, antiderivatives. So everyone here is comfortable with the idea that if, if you have a function little f, little f, then an antiderivative of that, we use capital F, is a function that when you take the derivative of capital of f, capital F, you get little f, right? So for example, uh, for example, if we take little f to be 2x, and we say, hey, what's the antiderivative of that? You would be talking about a function capital F of x, which would be what? Square. x squared. But you could also have any constant added to that, so plus c. Everyone here is comfortable with this idea? You sure? You sure, sure? Okay. The plus c? So do you agree that the derivative of x squared is equal to that? Right? So that is an antiderivative, but I could have added any number I want out here, right? I could have put a plus 3, because if I take derivative of this, derivative of 3 is 0, and I still get x squared, don't I? But I could have made that 3 or 30, or any number I wanted, right? So anytime we talk about antiderivatives, any time, every time, each time, right? You talk about antiderivative, you will always have a plus c added on to the end. Always. So capital F, of X, capital F is an antiderivative of F. Well, if it is, then capital F of X plus C is what we call the general antiderivative. All right, <clears throat> next idea here is that this is the same picture. This, this red function is 2X. This blue function is X squared. And since we want to talk about all of the X squareds with every, every constant plus C that you could think of, you can imagine that you actually have what we, what we call a family of answer, a family of functions. So when, you, when you're given a function like 2x and you say, hey, talk about the antiderivative, it's actually a collection, a family of functions that all look the same. They're all parabolas, x squared. They're just moved up or down, however many units you want, right? The key is that it's not one answer. It's an infinite number of answers that we get. All right, uh, that's another picture. Okay, so what are some antiderivatives we need to know? Let me get back to this. Let's get to the, the power rule because since you've all seen this, I want to make sure you're comfortable. What if f of x is equal to x to a power, n? So I just gave you the example x squared, right? But what if, if, if it's x to any power? And we want to know what the antiderivative is. Who wants to tell me from Cal 1? So n x to the n plus 1 plus c? Close. Close. You have, you have to add 1 to that power. OK, so you have to add 1 to this power. And then you have to do what? You have to divide by that power as well. Now in my classes, I instead of dividing, I'll, I'll do it this way. You can do that plus c. OK, that's, that's one way it looks. Or in my classes, what I did is I put out front 1 over n plus 1 and then times x to the n plus 1 plus c. This is known as the power rule. Does that look familiar? Yeah. You sure? We'll do a couple of examples with this. I, just, I don't want to go through the whole power rule if you all have all seen it at some point. I'll do some examples with this. But there is one little caveat to this. This doesn't always work, right? There's one power that this formula breaks down. 
negative 1, right? If n is negative 1, this formula doesn't work. So this works, this is the formula if n is not negative 1. By the way, these formulas are on your formula sheets, right? I'll, I'll get to them in a minute. In the, uh, in the e book, you'll see them in the e book on this table here. This is what I'm actually looking at right now. If the function is x to the n and n is not negative 1, then the antiderivative is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. That's your, gen that's your antiderivative. Then you do plus c, and that gives you the, the general. So what happens if n is negative 1? So what if, this, what if this was a negative 1 right here? We'd be looking at what? What's the, what's the function, though? What's, what's the function if n is negative 1? What's this function? If, x is, if, if n is negative 1, we're looking at the function x is negative 1, which is 1 over x, right? What's the antiderivative of that? Natural log. Natural log. Right? So that we just have to know that the antiderivative of this is the natural log and absolute value. You have to have absolute value of x plus some constant. So this right here is called the power rule, right, for antiderivatives. And then this is, this is how we uh, take care of that one exception. So we're going to do an example, because I know a lot of you said you've seen this, but let's just do an example that, make, that really kind of makes sure that you know how to use this rule. So let's say that we have the function f of x equals, let's go with 3x minus 5 square root of x plus um, 8 cube root of x minus 9. All right, there's a function, little f. I want us to find capital F of x, capital F. I want, to find, I want to find the general antiderivative. So just remember, we're going to do a plus c at the end. So when it comes to antiderivatives, again, going back to Cal 1, what you learned about um, in Cal 1, are we, allowed, are we allowed to take the antiderivative of each one of these separately? Yes. yes. It's just like the derivative. When you take a derivative of a sum or difference, you can do each term individually. Yes. Yeah. I would say explicitly find the general antiderivative. I'm just trying to be lazy and not write it all out. But I would be on a test. I'd be very explicit about what I want. All right. So I'm going to do these individually, right? So let's try this. Okay. First piece here. Three x to the first power, right? X to the first power. I can use the power rule. And what about the 3 in front? What am I going to do with the 3 in front? Okay, so that it will be divided by 2. But in terms of like when you find an antiderivative, if you have a constant attached to the function, that constant will just come with it, right? You don't have to do anything to it. So I'm going to put the 3 here. And then times, now let's take the antiderivative of that. And so use the power rule. So what goes out front? I'll put the power rule over here. Right, if, if this is this, the antiderivative was, I'm going to use this notation, 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1. That's the answer, so long as n is not negative 1. So in this case, n is not negative 1, so I'm going to put here 1 over 2 x squared. Right, all I'm doing is adding 1 to that power, makes it 2, and then I divide by, I do 1 over that number. Questions there? We comfortable? Sure? So the only question I have with that yeah. is like, instead of doing like x squared over 2, I know it's over 1 half out. Yeah. Is that for, is that, does that become more convenient? Well, in, in calculus, a lot of times when we were like taking derivatives, didn't we always have the constant out front, like so that it just kind of came with us the whole time? Like it, the notation that we normally use in calculus is like if you were faced with this versus this. I would say a calculus, engineering, physics, that, you know, 
those, that group of people are going to prefer this notation. Only because if I need to take derivative, you know, I'm just going to pop, pop the power out and just work with this fraction in front, as opposed to this, which just doesn't work as well with the whole, the rules of differentiation. So it's the same answer, though. You get the same answer. I think the book does do this more than this, uh, than, than this, this notation. I'm not done. I'm going to clean this. I'm going to put three halves on the next line. I'm going to put three over two. I'm not going to leave it as three times a half. But I will have the fraction out front. OK, for this one, I have a minus sign. So I put minus. I bring the five. And then now, this is really x to the half, isn't it? So we need to add one to a half. What's one half plus one? Three over two, three halves. So I'm, I'm going to leave a space in front. The space in front, I'm leaving for this fraction right here. Right now, I'm doing this piece right here. So I'm going to do x to the three over two. And then I'm supposed to do one over that number three over two in front of it. That will flip. I'm just, I'm just making sure I show the detail. Questions there? You sure? Plus eight. OK, this is x to the 1 third, right? And so I need to add 1 to 1 third. Four thirds. Four thirds. So I'm going to have times, let me leave a space again in front, x to the 4 thirds, but in front of that 1 over 4 thirds, which again will flip, will become 3 fourths. And then finally, minus 9, and what's the antiderivative of a constant? A constant times x, right? So be careful. Don't think derivative, because derivative of a constant is 0, right? But when you go backwards, you actually, the, the variable appears. So the antiderivative of 9 would just be 9x. And then plus c. OK? So now I'm just going to start putting things together. This together, that's 3 halves x squared. All right, here, when I flip this over, it becomes 2 thirds, doesn't it? 2 over 3. And then I have to multiply that times 5. Let me just do that on the side here. 5 times 2 thirds is 10 thirds. x to the 3 over 2. Plus, OK, I need to do this now. So that's 8 times 1 over 4 thirds. That's the same as 8 times 3 fourths, right, like that? 24 over 4, which is 6. So that's just 6 x to the 4 thirds, and then minus 9x plus c. And what was always the good news about antiderivatives if you wanted to see if you were right? You can take the derivative, and the derivative, if the derivative turns out to be the original expression, then you know you did it right, right? You can always check your answer, as long as you know how to differentiate. Yes? I had like an algebra question. Yes. So when it comes to powers, like powers of 2, 3, 4, it's super easy to visualize. You just multiply a number by itself that many times. So, but when it's like a fraction or something like that, like I don't entirely understand how that works. I'm not sure I understand your question. So if I have like 2 to the power of 2, I know that, oh, like that's just 2 times 2. It's by itself. And then 2 to the power of 3 yeah. is 2. Got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. But like when it's a fraction or something like that, I don't entirely know like how to understand that. Like how to like I can work through it. I can use it obviously. Okay, that's not really a topic here, but I will address slightly what you're talking about. That's a conversation for us in office hours. But I'll, I'll give you this. Let's say you have two raised to the. Um, let's go with three fourths. I think this is what you're asking me. You're not quite sure what that is. Like if that was 2 cubed, that would be 2 times 2 times 2. OK, this really means the fourth root of 2 cubed. That's what that means. Now, what is the fourth root of 2? That means what number times itself 4 times gives you 2. And then whatever that answer is, you cube it. I don't know if that yeah. helps, but that it's, this does not mean you multiply 2 times 2 times 2 3 fourths times. That's not what that means. Yeah? OK. So 
yeah, let's talk in my office more about that if you want to get deeper into that. All right, okay? All right. Now look, if you are not, like if I asked, did you see antiderivatives? Everyone said they did. But if you feel uncomfortable with this, please come, come by and, and you know, meet with me. Let's get you up to speed. I don't want you to like sink because of the first day you didn't want to tell me you were uncomfortable with this. First day of talking about antiderivatives. So I'm going to leave that up to you. All right, <clears throat> moving on. So let's say um, we do a quick review of an idea from Cal 1 that hopefully you talked about, and this has to do with linear motion. You have things moving like in straight lines. If you have a graph of a function, and let's say this is your position function, right, whatever it is, we'll say it's a function of t. So usually we use, we use different letters for position functions. Sometimes we use s of t, sometimes we use um, d of t. I think the book uses s of t, so I'm going to say this is s of t for position. So you've got some, some function that gives you where something is at every point in time. Like at, at t equals 0, it was 5 feet. At t equals 1, it was 10 feet, right? It's some graph of some position of some function. And then what would happen if we take that function, s, and we take its derivative? What function would that give us? Velocity. So that'll give us the velocity function. So that would be some other function. We'll call that v of t. Here's t. So that's v of t. And then if we do the derivative again, right, that would be the second derivative of the position, which is, you could also say is the, the derivative of the velocity, however you want to look at it. It's the second derivative of this one, or it's the first derivative of the velocity. That gives you the acceleration. So quick show of hands. How many of you did not see that in Cal 1? Who did not see that? Everyone saw that in Cal 1? Or in some other class? OK, acceleration, right? So we'll put a of t, t. All right, so this tells us that if we know everything about where an object is at every point in time, Cal 1 allows us to figure out the speed, the velocity of that object at every point in time, and then we can also find the acceleration at every point in time. And so what we can do with the antiderivative is we can start at that end and we can work our way backwards and recover position. But there was a drawback to that. What was the drawback if you try it? If you try and go from acceleration backwards, Yeah, so when you go backwards, you have a family, right, plus c. So you don't know exactly which family member we're talking about. So you have to be given some sort of information to be able to get that exact function. And then to go back again, same scenario. You have a family, so you need some conditions. So we call those initial conditions. And so let's do an example, just so we can, can work through one of these. Um, I'll make one up. So let's say that if I tell you that a of t is negative 30, uh, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, is that what I want? Yeah, negative 32. Let's say a of t is negative 30. So a of, a of t, I'm giving you the acceleration of some object at some point in time is constant. Right? That's what I'm giving you. And I'm going to tell you that the velocity at zero is some number, which I'm not even going to tell you, is, is v naught. So at zero, the velocity is v zero. Not, I'm not sharing that number with you. And s of zero, the position at zero, I'm not going to share with you either. I'm going to call that S0. Now, these could be numbers if I wanted to give them to you, but I'm, I'm going to give them to you like general, general um, arbitrary, sorry, is what I meant to say, arbitrary values. OK, so the question now is find S of t. So in other words, find the position function. So we start with our a of t. From a of t, 
we're going to try and get to V of t, and from V of t, we're going to try and get to S of t. So to do that, we have to do the antiderivative and then the anti again, don't we? The anti twice. All right, so starting with the first one. To get V of t, you have to give me the antiderivative of negative 32, right? There's, there's the acceleration function. What's the antiderivative of that? Negative 32. T or X? T, T. T because we're, the variable is T here, right? So negative 32 T plus C. Y'all buy that? Yes? So far so, so far so good? Now we don't know what C is, do we? No. Not exactly. But we do know something about the velocity. We know that we, when we plug zero into the velocity function, our answer should be V sub zero. So I'm now going to use that information. I'm going to say, but v of 0 equals v naught. That's the way we say that, which means that when I plug 0 in for t here, I get what? I should get what? v naught, or v sub 0, right? That's what should happen. So that would imply that what? c is whatever that number v naught is, right? So let me go back and write this again. V of t equals negative 32t plus some number v naught that I don't know what it is, but it's been given to me as an arbitrary value. So it could be anything, but it, would have, it was provided to me, all right? I just don't know exactly what it is. All right, so we've got the uh, velocity function. Now, we do the antiderivative again to get the position, right? So to figure out position, you do the antiderivative of this, and there are two terms, aren't there? So the antiderivative of this one, the negative 32, is going to come with us, right? And then we're going to do the power rule on this. That's a t to the first power. So the power rule says I'm going to add 1 to that power, so we're going to have a t squared. And what goes in front of it? 1 half. So I'm going to put times 1 half t squared. And then I'm done with that, right? That's the antiderivative here. Plus, what's the antiderivative of a constant? Uh, v sub naught t. V, sub, v naught times t, right? So that's that constant times t. Plus Am I done? Plus d. some constant c, but I'm going to use d because I don't want to use c twice and have them have different values. Yes, question? So that subscript that line, no. that you wouldn't say that, would you say that that's a zero? Like in terms it, of yes, it is. Um, because what V naught and S naught really represent is like velocity at time zero, position at time zero. So V with the little zero, that zero usually represents time. And it usually implies the, the, time, the velocity at the beginning or the, the position at the beginning. Okay, so that, that wouldn't be something that you would like add to my type of No. Yes, yes, but only because our, our, variable, our, our variable here is t, right? Mm -hmm. So there, yeah, next to this, there's an implied t to the zero. That's right, yes. Not t sub zero, not t subscript zero, t raised to the zero. Okay, yes, yeah, so yeah. that's what I was getting confused on with the v, that's why I Yeah, no, no, it's not v raised to the zero, it's, that's just a notation we use to represent something at, at the beginning. Okay. Velocity at the beginning, right? Position, this is velocity at the beginning of the time, this is position at the beginning of the time, which is why there's a zero here and a zero here. Yes? I plugged in zero into the velocity. See, this was our velocity function, right? But see, remember we were told that when you plug zero into velocity, you get this answer? Okay. Right? So what I did is I took that velocity function. I said, hey, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that with zero, right? Plus C. And my answer better be V okay. naught. I'm about to do the same thing right here. Okay. But let me clean this up. What does this become? Negative 16 
t squared plus v naught t plus d, right? That's where I am here? However, I know that, right? I know that. So I'm going to put here, but s, when I plug 0 into s, the position function, when I plug 0 into the position function, I better get s sub 0. So let's plug 0 into this. Negative 16, 0 squared plus v naught times 0 plus d equals s naught. And because this poly these polynomial, those go away, and you get d is s naught. Yes? Are you going to expect it to work out that clearly on the test, or can I be like, hey, I know my... I know my it's easy if you're plugging in 0, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're plugging in 0, then d is just going to be whatever that value is. Yeah. But if my, if my conditions here are something like v of 1 equals 5, then that's going to be a little different, yeah. you know? Yeah, just put it in there. Yeah, you don't have to. Yep. So I think I'm at a, a final point here. I know what D is. D is S naught. So I have this. My position function, S of T, is negative 16 T squared plus V naught T plus S naught. That's my answer. where v naught is the velocity at time zero, right? And s naught is the position at time zero. So does anyone recognize this formula? Yeah, it's kinematics. It's kinematics, yeah. yes? Yeah. This, is, this is the formula that tells you basically if you take an object and you drop it on Earth, if you take out air resistance, this tells you exactly how high the position of that object off the ground at any point in time. Where time zero is right before you let it go, and then as soon as you let it go, the clock starts, and this gives you your position. So that's the formula right, that you see in a physics class or whatever it is, engineering. What, the reason I did this is because I want to show you how did this formula come about? What was the one piece of information we needed? We needed that, right? The acceleration. And the acceleration of any object that you drop is just the acceleration of gravity. So this is, this negative 32 is the acceleration of gravity in feet per second per second. Most of the time in physics you do meters per second per second, so it's like negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But if you convert it to feet per second, you get that, and then you get this formula. So the, the big picture is that you could conclude from this that <clears throat> if you, as long as you know the acceleration of gravity, right, whether it be on the moon or Earth or wherever it is that you live, you can always recover the position function, right? If you, 